break out the marshmallows and the spooky stories for the campfire, it's time for Architecture Coffee and Ink. Hello, this is Hollywood C, and you're listening to Architecture Coffee and Ink, a podcast dedicated to introducing concepts, detailing out designs, and tackling the architecture you might not realize the meaning behind. I'm your hostess, and I'm here today to start introducing you to the designs that make you wonder why. So I ask you to brew your coffee, grab your sketchbook and pen, and let's begin. Welcome to the show, old, new, and in-between listeners. This is actually the last of a three-part mini-series. Each topic stands alone, but each episode is slightly shorter than my normal episodes, and each one has been released at the same time, three days in a row. This episode is by listener request, and it's going to be similar to the bonus Halloween episode I released in October. Today, I am going to tell you tales of cryptid architecture. I genuinely hope that this fulfills your request. A quick trigger warning, this is scary stories about sapient architecture, missing villages, and more, so people's death in the paranormal will be discussed. If this bothers you or triggers you in any way, please see my normal episodes where it's just architecture. While I won't go into graphic details at any point, I want to make sure that everyone is comfortable and has an enjoyable time. Are you ready? Let's begin. Cryptids are any creature, animal, or now architecture that is not confirmed. With that in mind, we are taking the last day of three episode week to discuss architecture where the buildings are alive, missing, or somewheres in between. Because this isn't my normal show, I will not be surprised to find that many may want to skip this episode and either listen to others release this week or wait until next week when we release our regularly scheduled program. But if you are still here, sit back, grab your blankets, and hold your coffee cups with both hands as we learn just what to do when the house chases you. Baba Yaga is a creature filled with the old magics. Depending upon the myth, legend, and the country, She changes from a wild one to mistress, the creature, but most often is a witch. She is called by many names and variations, but each comes with a warning and a tale. Approach with caution, traveler, or say the wrong thing, or bend your tongue falsely around a word, and vengeance will be delivered swiftly. She is able to be both a source of information and guidance, and a also a dangerous hag, bringing death and trickery. Currently, she calls Eastern Europe home and roams the countryside riding a mortar, sweeping the air with a broom of moon-colored birch, and navigating with the pestle. She will sometimes have legions or host spirits, and sometimes is connected with two sisters. And with the two, her temper is often smooth, and she can operate as a guardian for the life waters. But regardless of which job she is performing, whether she guides the heroes or steals children, she is undeniably a grotesque figure with protruding bones and sagging skin showing sharp feature. Her eyes deep and unyielding set so in her head that she can pierce you with a glance. All the items she carries has use, the mortar and the pistol to grind the bones of those she consumes. But those who complete the tasks she puts forward may be rewarded with knowledge and advice. Make no mistake, you cannot run, for her house is balanced on a set of chicken legs, and as you run, the tempo of the house stalking behind you keeps pace. Alive, all on its own, the only way to enter her quarters is through a single trap door in the center of the floor. The things that it parades as windows are only eyes, and it seems to come and go as they please, depending upon the story in the teller. But those same legs that can hunt you down if you cross the Baba Yaga are more often used to flee, preventing both escape from the witch's home, but also prohibiting entrance. Surrounding the house is the skulls of humans atop their own bones that create the fence. But the thing is, 
This might be real. A cabin on lakes exists in the same region of the world. Used the Sami people we spoke about in a previous episode. A, a cabin is balanced on the remains of tree stumps with the roots clawing into the ground, preventing those unwelcome from coming in. Other references and examples from history can be found, whether used for funerals or as a place to pay homage to deities and spirits that litter the area. How hard would it be for a witch to capture a deity, to merge with the home? As fickle as the weather she controls, who's to say she'd stop at one? So, if you are smart and pure of heart, seek her out to answer your questions after you have completed a task or two. But if you fail, you have been warned. Your skull will be torn and your bones left only for the fence to adorn. What do you do if the village goes missing? This next tale is even worse as the idea of a missing village has occurred multiple times throughout history. Included in the urban legend are villages reached only through a single tunnel in Japan, an entire colony lost in a country only starting to kick off, and a village seemingly abandoned, the residents evacuated in the middle of the night in China, and even a village in Ireland along the bay where its own residents buried it and removed all traces to be found. But of these, none creep down the spine, quite like the urban legend of the abandoned village of Anjikuni Lake in Canada. A tale that's validity remains in question, but I will tell the tale regardless. In 1930, Anjikuni Lake village lies along the shores of the lake, housed among the rocks, but right with natural resources, caribou, and the lake itself, seems to provide for the people who call it home, rumored to be both friendly and welcoming to those who travel and hunt along the lake's banks. One day in the winter, a man named Joe LaBelle arrives in a flurry to an office to report that the villagers have gone missing and the mounted police must come at once. As he weaves his tale, he speaks of, em of graves emptied, of pets left to die and food to rot and left to stay suspended in time is the natural clutter of the everyday. Clothes in the process of being mended, chores half done, and dolls left never to finish an untold play. The thing is, the truth is even more bizarre than the half weaved tale of tragedy and woe. In 1930 and 1931, references were made citing the story of LaBelle and giving the village slightly more realistic details. But in 1959, a man named Frank Edwards wrote three pages, changing multiple details and including no references for these changes. Then again, in 1976, an article was published starting the debate. A man named Dwight Whelan wrote the article that would bring the story back to the forefront of everyone's mind. And from there, podcasts began sharing details and people found witnesses and legends became the whispered rumors discussed only in the dead of night, conveyed in hushed voices over campfires and under blankets. But our last tale has no validation, no sources and no references. I will tell it as it was told to me. The house has no tragic backdrop to explain, and no urban legends. It remains similar to many stories, and often in the depths of the internet when I cannot sleep and dare to search, I can only find the bare hints of common elements. Even now, it plagues my sleep, and I fear the occasional quiet moments that leave me alone with my thoughts for entirely too long. I came upon a house. First in a dream, where the walls cracked with something worse than rain, and the bones jangled underneath, packed in crawl spaces too small to retrieve. The windows were so caked with dirt and held by the weight of a thousand days of hard weather that they stuck too much to replace. Nothing happened in the dream. Nothing but the staining of the yellow streamers surrounding the yard, staining my mind's eye as the last thing I could but I was convinced once I woke that the house itself was calling for me. No entities, no creatures, just the house. Then, on one day, I made a new friend. A friend who lived in another part of town. 
opposite where I lived. With my noisy dogs, warm lights, and cascading plants taking entirely too much and too little space in the garden at the same time. I was going to spend the night, my first sleepover, and when we pulled up, my heart sank for it was the house. The same house plaguing me. They were so excited to share. Both my parents and I love fixing up and renovating homes. So we toured while I prayed and thanked whomever was listening that at least my little sister was with the sitters at home. And the more I walked, the further it pressed on, the wordless voice pushing against me. It was the same hallway connected to the same kitchen with the weird stains and the creaking floorboards and two tall stairs. And though we were told to run and play, unable to breathe, we remained close to listen. To listen to how my friend's parents confessed that remains were found in the very crawl space I imagined while they were working on the house, which is why the yellow streamers surrounded the yard. That same horrible yellow. After all, the police want to make sure that the crime scene is visible. The part that taints the story the most, every so many years since the house was built, the same events occur. The family all dies with no witnesses, no suspects. And I know that it's only a matter of time before the house reaches back out to me and I can no longer fight the lure of the dreams. One day, I know, those yellow streamers will be for me. But once again, a big thank you to all my listeners. <laughs> this was a great recommendation, and I was extremely appreciative of the opportunity to share a spooky story. Actually, now that I think about it, all my stories this week have been spooky. Next week, I will do a totally happy cultural landscape to make up for it. I know I say this every week, but please rate and review. If you liked it, loved it, hated it, let me know. I love feedback and hearing from everyone. And more importantly, sparking conversation. We again have a Facebook page and private group, both of which are under the same name, Architecture Coffee and Inc., which is again a pretty young podcast. Architectureinc.design.blog is the website, and everything will be linked into the show notes. Remember that these are mini episodes this week, so not what we'd normally do here on the show. But as always, may your coffee mugs be full and your inkwells never run dry. <laughs>